Hello and welcome to the opening race of the Canada Division of the 2021 Hart Can-Am Series. Today we're in Michigan for the only race outside the Great White North and the double header season opener alongside the USA Division. 32 competitors are lined up to start the race. Half are from the United States, actually, with 16 drivers representing 11 states alongside 11 Canadians from 5 provinces and 5 drivers representing other countries from around the globe. Al Lagasse put his Mustang on pole alongside rising star Cassie Gerdes, who turned some heads by winning the newcomers race. Pace car off the track now, 50 laps or 100 miles is going to be the race distance and the season is underway here at Michigan International Speedway. Pretty even there on the start, Spencer Fullerton drops low but Lagasse defends down at the bottom of the track, Fitzwater trying to work the middle and they are already four wide back around fifth place. This is a prime time to make moves. These cars are still getting up to speed, so starts and restarts are going to be some of the only times drivers will be able to hold it flat out around the bottom. Lagacy holding on to around a two car length lead over Spencer Fullerton. Lucina Gallo trying to get it on the bottom of the track, but Lagacy is going to lead lap number one. Small Nozomi returns and she's driving one of the most distinct cars on the grid. But she's going to wipe some of those anime characters off the car, getting up into the wall. J.F. Fingai narrowly avoids contact with the 99 there as she tries to re-merge. Fullerton also had to take evasive action just uh, up in front. A lot of these guys are trying to shake the rust off at 175 miles an hour and a lot of these guys are rookies, 11 of them in fact. Zachary Fitzwater Sr. has charged his way to second, but is currently boxed in uh, by Cassie Gertis. Now they're four wide for second with two rookies in there, Gallo and Brian Hart at the bottom of the track in the number 35. Into turn one, a big stack up there involving contact with Irving and Flintstone sent Nelson and LaSavage around in a chain reaction. Everyone else got away from it okay, and that will bring out the first caution of the race. Everyone would come down pit lane under the caution flag. We've still got 44 laps to go though, so it's not going to be possible to go to the end without a few more cautions, I think. Uh, LaSavage went out of the race, but Nelson stayed in. Fullerton had a slow stop and lost eight spots, while the biggest gainer appeared to be Casey Lester, who climbed six. Al Lagasse was first and in, first out, and he led the field back to the green, followed by Cassie Gerdes and J.F. Finguy. Gerdes gets a good restart and goes to the bottom before Lagasse can cover it. Yepes in the black and white. Guinness Mustang has a good run on the bottom as well. Off turn two. Cassie Gerdes trying to clear Al Lagasse. Lagasse forcing the issue here. He's got he's got a run with some help from JF, but ultimately would not be successful. Cassie Gerdes goes to the front of the track. Yepes would prove himself to be a quick learner by pulling the identical move that Gerdes just did on Lagasse on Gerdes herself one lap later. Yepes only has one previous Hark start to his name. It was at Auto Club though, another fast and wide two-miler. Kyle Collins is proving to be one of the only cars in the field that can consistently use the bottom of the track to his advantage. In just four laps, he's worked his way from 10th up into 2nd from the restart, and the Newfoundlander is going to snap the lead away from Yepes through turn three. Yepes and Collins would trade the lead a couple of more times as the Venezuelan driver uh, gets the lead off of turn four there. Patrick Smith was also in the mix briefly but wasn't able to get anything done. Awfully racy back there. They were five wide for a moment. But one lap later, Patrick Smith would get the help that he needed uh, with support from Cassie Gertis. But patience is in short supply and Gertis is going on a move for himself and Kyle Collins is going to open up a, a midline there all on his lonesome. JF Fingai joins him down the back straightaway and he's going to make that move stick. Kyle Collins can put that car exactly where he wants it today. Definitely looks like the class of the field so far. Off of turn four. Oh, Yepes gets into Smith. Down into Gertis. Lagacy and Gertis go spinning. Gallo involved. Anderson's on his roof there. In the number 43, he got hit hard by Nick Pericles. A number of other cars got a piece as well. Deja vu to 2017 Fontana. 
In a twist of fate, it was the driver who got the worst of the 2017 Fontana crash, who was the one that got this wreck going. Yepes turned Smith down the track. That collected Gerdes, who collected Legacy. Gallo nearly had it missed, but move up in front of Pitt and others were driving through the wreck blind from the smoke. Pitt, Thomas, and Brian Hart all got small pieces but kept going. Faulkner and Jeffrey Fingai got bigger pieces. Lester, Fullerton, Tavolaris involved. And finally, Anderson got slammed by Pericles as he drove to the bottom. And Anderson went for a enormous flip down the front straightaway, rolling ten and a half times and coming to rest on his roof. On board, Benoit Lefebvre Irvine from France as he just narrowly makes it by that. Emmett Vanson is coming in like a bat out of hell through there. Jeffrey Fingai and Tristan Faulkner were oh so close to having that crash missed, but both took terminal damage from this accident. Unfortunately, it appears that Duncan Curse is passing through to one of his replacements, and Jeffrey Fingai continues to not be able to catch a break to save his life. They both join Anderson and Pericles on their way back to the hauler after this accident. All but 11 cars would come down pit road under this yell to pick up a splash of fuel. I'm personally very surprised that anyone stayed out. These drivers are almost certainly going to be betting on another caution in order to even have a chance of making it to the end of the race. Those at the front might have, might have been caught sleeping or they're betting on there being another wreck, which to be honest, seems like a safe bet after the racing we've seen so far. Kyle Collins led them back to the restart, but J.F. Fingai quickly looks to the inside to grab the lead in front of his home crowd. J.F., short for John Fitzgerald, is actually the father of longtime Hart competitor Jeffrey Fingai. Together, these two are the only Michiganders in the field, and with Jeffrey out, the pressure is on J.F. in his very first Hark start to... Uh, put up or shut up pretty much. Pole sitter Al Lagasse took a number of knocks from a lot of different cars in the rack a few laps ago. His pit crew did all they could but ultimately something would let go just a couple of laps back underway. In the same lap, Annie Thomas's car would bog severely in turn one from seventh place. Luckily that bobble would not cause a chain reaction, only Nicky Martinez was right behind Thomas there. Thomas kept that car out of the way of the catching pack. She would head down pit road and le lose a couple of laps and that car would never be the same. She'd come out four to five seconds lap, uh, per lap off of the pace of the lead draft. JF continues to keep Kyle Collins honest but so is Bridget Pitt and, and Emmett Vanson continues to show reckless abandon on the bottom of the track. Amazingly, none of Collins' challengers have been able to get a lap led yet. Zachary Fitzwater Sr., the wily old veteran, gives Collins a shove down the back and his patience on the outside line will pay off as he takes the lead through turns three and four. In a one-on-one -on -one battle where draft played less of a factor, J.F. Finguy was finally able to snatch the lead away and get a lap led. Although he's a Hark rookie, he is a legendary short tracker who's nicknamed Mr. 200 for a legacy of winning more than 200 short tracks races all across Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. His win count's currently 214, but he's looking to get a special 215th on the high banks. Fitzwater got the last lap led, but Collins is going to squeeze himself back into the picture. He's side drafting the 59 a little bit down the back straightaway. There's some new names up in the picture. And Indiana native Ike Durbin is in the Toyota Supra. He worked the bottom and now he's trying to force a fourth lane uh, there. And Lucas Knight is now third on the outside line. Somehow though, without a whole ton of drafting help, Collins snapped the lead away from Fitzwater. These guys have created a wall of air in front of them though and the whole pack's closed in on the front. We've still got 23 laps to go and the lead pack quickly approaches the slow car of Annie Thomas. She looked like a fish out of water there, didn't really commit to a line and screwed over J.F. Finguy in a big portion of the pack by not getting out of the way until halfway down the back straightaway. Hopefully someone wakes up the 93 spotter and gets them a cup of coffee because they got a lot of work to do the rest of the race even if the 93 isn't racing people for position. 
With the pack spread out, Kyle Collins now has some breathing space. Collins is the sole representative of the Maritimes in this series. He's now in his sophomore year. Thrice in his rookie season, he came within a razor's edge of victory. He lost the lead twice on the last lap of different races, and he blew an engine from what was almost certain to be a dominant win at Brasstown Bald. The strength of the draft isn't allowing Collins to get away, and the pack is quickly reforming. Ike Durbin just pulled what's got to be one of the most insane-looking passes I've ever seen. There, don't, don't think you could have fit a credit card between him and Bridget Pitt on the outside. 2017 Hark champion Caitlin Sang was one of the drivers held up most by Annie Thomas. Initially, I thought Sang was lingering behind the pack as part of a fuel strategy, since Sang's one of the cars that is under threat of running out. But her and Brian Hart have completely lost the tail of the pack. The only cars running behind Sang are cars with damage. Nelson and Flintstone are clinging to the back of Sang. Then it's a... Uh, there's a gap back to Tavolaris, and then a, a pack of three duking it out three wide for 23rd. You love to see it. Uh, those, still, those guys still putting on a show, even when they're destined for a poor result. Nikki Martinez and Emmett Vanson are two first-timers trying to make their way into the top five, but there's not a lot of teamwork amongst the guys on the bottom of the track, and they'd end up losing some ground on the front cars. Emmett, journeyman Emmett Vanson is racing for a self-owned operation without sponsorships, and he's been merciless today and has been really hard to work with simply because if he sees an opening, he's going to go for it. It's stalling out his progress a little bit, but if he keeps up that no-holds-barred style at other tracks, Tracks, he might be going home with either the trophy or the steering wheel. After three consecutive laps trying to work the bottom to get by Kyle Collins for the lead, Patrick Smith and honestly the rest of the field would catch a break uh, from Collins' dominance when they caught Annie Thomas through turn four. Thomas did move from the bottom to the track, top of the track on approach, but at least held a consistent line once they got there. Nicky Martinez had the most difficult time of anyone navigating around Thomas this time and would lose the draft. In the meanwhile, there's been a change up for the lead. J.F. Finguy got by Zachary Fitzwater Sr. and will get another lap led, but Fitzwater pulled the crossover move on him and it's going to depend on where Diego Yepes goes, who, who gets the lead, but he ends up making a third line actually. Fitzwater Sr. takes it for now. And Yepes might have been caught sleeping or focusing too hard on the 29 because he's let Patrick Smith through. And he gets back in line following Smith for now as they try and make something work on the bottom of the track. But Yepes makes it three wide down into turn three. Everyone boxed in now. Not really anywhere for anyone to go. Emmett Vanson trying to push Yepes through. Nope, just kidding. Emmett Vanson's going to make it four wide on the apron. And both Yepes and Vanson would ultimately uh, lose out. Smith and Fitzwater, a couple of laps later, still going for the lead position as Kyle Collins nearly dumps J.F. Finguy down into Tristan Wilhoyt. And all of a sudden, there's a draft line on the inside, and that's going to shove Ike Durbin past both the 04 and the 59. We're in the final 10 laps of the race, and things are ramping up and quickly. Daniel Bouchard and Tyler Faber made it five wide into turn one, each opening up a line around J.F. Finguy, and it would ultimately be Faber uh, taking the most positions out of it. Patrick Smith is still trying to get past Ike Durbin, and Kyle Collins has managed to sneak his way into third. He's going to try the outside line through turn one, but he might have washed up too high there into the marbles, but he's got Bridget Pitt for company and that might help him recover. Zachary Fitzwater Sr. side drafted the 48 down the straightaway and he's gonna dive it to the bottom of the track to get the lead and bridge at Pitt from the top of the track to the bottom, mid corner to make it four wide as we're coming down for just eight laps remaining. Could you imagine this at the finish? Zachary Fitzwater Sr. ended up leading that lap, but I'll be damned if I know who's going to lead the next one. Top 11 cars were covered by just 32 hundredths of a second. Bridget Pitt can hold the bottom and had to check up there, and now and Will Hoyt made it five wide through turns one and two. There's no way these guys are going to make it to the end if they keep racing like this. 
William Brock gets out of shape and slaps the wall through turn three. What a shame for him. He was just getting into the picture for the race win. He'll get away relatively unscathed, but that's broken up the field just a little bit at the back. Those drivers are going to have to regroup and go for one last charge in the final laps. Ike Durbin still leads. Patrick Smith, try as he might, hasn't been able to quite clear the 86 in any of his challenges. And with less than six laps remaining, no one has any more time to be patient. Collins and Fitzwater are coming through. This power duo might be the only drivers with a reasonable shot of getting past Ike Durbin. But Durbin gets held up by Annie Thomas just for a moment, and that's going to allow Fitzwater Sr. to go flying through on the inside. Ike Durbin's going to lose more positions, and Kyle Collins is all caught up behind Annie Thomas. There's nothing he can do. That might be his chances at race victory completely over as he's going to have to wait for the entire field to go through. We've got new challengers inside the top five. Tyler Faber as well as Daniel Bouchard are in the mix. Ike Durbin on a recovery effort here in fourth. Patrick Smith again trying the inside but can't make anything work for now. Another issue is lurking for some drivers, and that is fuel mileage. Spencer Fullerton and Tony Tavalaris come down pit lane with three laps remaining. Fullerton was out of gas, and Tony Tavalaris had a tire going down. Sure enough, coming to two to go, Ike Durbin pulls down from fourth, along with Brock and Martinez. Durbin spent a lot of time leading that one, so I don't know whether he had a chance uh, to start with of making it to the end. Only 6 out of 11 drivers from the long cycle remain on the track, but critically, one of them is race leader Zachary Fitzwater Sr. He holds a commanding lead from now. No one behind him is working well together, and Faber, Yepes, Smith, and Vanson are racing for second. Other cars under threat of running out of fuel in the lead pack are Kyle Collins, J.F. Finguy, Bridget Pitt, Lucas Knight, and Caitlin Sang, although Caitlin Sang is apparently coming in this time by. Fitzwater Sr. getting the white f flag. Patrick Smith might be in the catbird seat if Fitzwater runs out of fuel. Oh, but he hesitates a little bit there, and here comes Yepes. Uh, the pitted cars are trying to come out on the track. They're three wide for second, but again, no organization. Yepes slips up in front of Smith. He might have a draft run. Oh, there's a wreck behind him. Nozomi Collins. That's J.F. Finguy up in a huge plume of smoke. Does anyone have anything left? For Fitzwater Sr. through the corner. Faber's trying to get a run on the inside. He's got Smith. Yep, is closing in. But Fitzwater Sr. somehow has managed to save fuel and hold off the pack, and he'll take victory here in Michigan. He really only knows how to win in spectacular fashion. He took his first win at Calder Park with an upset last lap pass. He won Devil's Bowl in a photo finish by one thousandth of a second. And now he wins Michigan while leading 10 laps with a fuel strategy that only had a 27% success rate. Truly a remarkable drive by the Australian as they're wrecking behind them on the cooldown lap. Racing for around 5th place on that final lap, Bouchard moved up, Nozomi moved down, and they came together. To add to that confusion and all that smoke, Nicky Martinez was getting up to speed on the apron when things broke loose, and J.F. Finguy dove down the track to try and avoid the crash and smashed hard into the back of Martinez. Kyle Collins actually ran out of fuel recovering from that accident, lost a couple of spots, uh, there, Nozomi trying to close in, but isn't quite able to get there. Maybe a hundred feet further, and Nozomi would have had one more spot. There was some confusion post-race as the pace car was sent out on the track unnecessarily. Wilhoyt had to take evasive action to miss it, and got on the brakes, causing a collision involving Casey Lester, Benoit Lothair Ravine, and Lucas Knight. Lucas Knight would actually run out of fuel on, on the cooldown lap immediately afterwards, trying to get that car back going. In fact, Fitzwater Sr. and Bridget Pitt, the only other remaining long cycle drivers who didn't run out of fuel, would both sputter out in turn four on the cool down lap. Not a single driver on that fuel strategy even had enough to complete the cool down lap at half throttle, showing how small the margin really was between winning and disaster for Fitzwater. And so Fitzwater takes a remarkable victory and gets a good head start on a possible championship effort with the Epes a close second. 
Tyler Faber pulled off a quiet podium with a big charge in the final laps, narrowly grabbing the spot from Patrick Smith at the line by just two hundredths. Strong run there by Smith, but had trouble getting and holding the lead. And despite my criticism for his lack of teamwork, Emmett Vanson pulled the top five. Bouchard finished sixth, Will Hoyt ran seventh, and Lucas Knight, Bridget Pitt, and Casey Lester capped off good top ten efforts. Benoit Lefer Irvine was the hard charger, gaining 21 spots from dead last at the start due to the invoking of a grid penalty stemming all the way back from the 2017 Pro Series. Collins looked to be quite possibly the dominant car of the day, but caught no breaks while trying to, nav trying to navigate the only lap traffic of Annie Thomas, and Sang must have pulled the fastest lap off while drafting at the back of the pack. As predictable, the point standings are almost identical to the race results, except both Kyle Collins and Al Lagacy have each gained a spot and displaced one driver due to their bonus points. Next up, we switch racing disciplines completely, as the series heads almost 2,000 miles or 3,000 kilometers northwest to Alberta for a 200 lap event at the Quarter Mile Edmonton International Raceway in Wetaskiwin, just south of the Edmonton metropolis.